Hello everyone and welcome to the second part of lesson 2. In this video we pick up where we left off in the previous lesson and continue discussing the 12 factors that affect your values and talk about 3 new factors. We will talk about the types of light, the light bounces and the surface normal. We covered most of them in the previous lessons and exercises but here we will take an in-depth look at each of them and see many examples and demonstrations on each one. But before we start, as always, if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit the like button, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and leave a comment down below. If you watched the exercise video I just uploaded a couple of days ago, you will see how the different type of light affected the scene in drastic ways. We saw how the rectangle direct light acted way differently than an omni light or a spotlight. How the size of the same type of light also changed the value, the cast shadows, and the mood of the whole scene. The four main archetypes of the light are the direct light, the ambient light, the omni light, and the rim light. Now other artists put in different type of light, but they can also merge into these types as well. Front light for example, or a side light, or even an overhead light are all types of direct light. The direct light is mostly used as a primary light in most situations, with an addition to the ambient light and the rim light as a second resources. With the direct light, all the surfaces that are close and pointing at the source light are gonna be the lightest, and all the ones turning away will be in the shadow. Direct light will also have a hot zone where most of the first bounces will hit directly, where the rest will be either hit by a secondary bounces or missed entirely, turning them into the shadows. The second type is the ambient light. This is mostly used in the overcast landscape to show the true colors of your scene. With an ambient diffused light, there is very little light affecting the basic value. So whatever values your object has, it will be mostly the same. This is usually used in concept art to show a neutral scene before any lighting applied to it. In most cases, the ambient light is used as a secondary light in a company to the direct light. So you would mostly see it affecting the shadow areas of the scene or the character and lighting up some of the shadows with a blue tint. The value you would normally see in a diffused light is a slight variation on the basic value. So if your object have a base value of 4, the light will be at 3 and the shadows will be at 5. No sharp light, no sharp shadows, and most importantly, no sharp cast shadows. The cast shadow is diffused by the fact that the object is hit in every and each direction, blurring the cast shadow around the bottom of the object. As I mentioned in the exercise video, large light sources will result in a very blurry shadow, and it doesn't get larger than an all-encompassing light source. The Omni light is my favorite as I mentioned before, it's a mystery inducing light source. It's also a favorite choice for many master artists. The reason is that the Omni light is a focal point by itself. Whenever there is one in the scene and no other light sources, your eyes will be searching for it and everything it illuminates. The values that comes out of an Omni light scene are very contrasted, especially around the light source. Very high values the closer you are to the light and very low values away from it. Secondary bounces will be very light and far between, just enough to see some of the details around the light. So here we see the values go from almost white all the way to complete darkness. With an omni light you get a full range of values and a very unique scene. The rim light is also rarely used as a primary source. It mostly comes with a direct light and it lights the far part of the object or scene to add more depth to it. But when it's used by itself, it's mostly to hide the identity of your subject and cover up most of the details only letting out the major shape or the silhouette of the subject matter. The values in a rim light situation are mostly dark, except for the far edges of the object being hit by the light behind it. Like we see in this scene, the middle of the object is the darkest since it's being the furthest away from the light, while the edges are the lightest either getting hit by the rim light directly or the secondary bounces from the surrounding area. As I said, it's really used like this. In most cases, it will be affecting one side of the object being hit from far away and mostly in a different color light. So if your primary light is toward the yellow, the rim light will be in the blue. So it's used mostly to balance your scene in values and colors. Alright, let's see some examples from the old masters on the types of light. In this example, we have a rim light used as a primary light. We can see that this isn't the darkest painting that you would expect from a rim light. The reason is that the artist has increased the intensity of the light source so much, the secondary bounces all around the scene made it much lighter than your typical rim light situation. Here we have two factors coming together and changing the values of the painting completely. If you look at the value scale, we see that the artist used mostly light to mid-tones values, which resulted in a mid to high key painting as we can see from the value chart. Most of the values here are in the mid section, which also makes it a mid contrast painting especially around the character. If we increase the contrast of the painting a little bit, we can pinpoint the exact location of the light. See the light is coming from the sun above, lighting up the top part of the character 
but its reflection on the ground or the secondary bounces are mainly what is lighting up the whole painting. Finally, if we reduce the values to the main three values, light, mid-tones, and dark, we see here that the most of the scene is in mid-tones, except for the ground, outside, and the sun coming in. The lowest values will be on the curtain to the left, since their basic values are dark and away from the direct hit of the sunlight at the corner of the room. So this is a good example how to use the rim light correctly, adding an angelic highlight all around the characters contrasted by the darkness of the doors. Okay, in the next example, we have a direct light coming from the top left, heading around the right mid part of the painting. A sunlight in a clear day would always be a direct light, so we can expect sharp shadows and clear values range from the absolute white to absolute dark. In the value chart, we see that even with the direct sunlight, it's still a low-key painting due to the cover of the foliage around. The contrast is in the mid to high range, especially in the focal point around the night to the right. If we add a bit more contrast to the painting, we can see where the light hit and what is the direction of the light. It's a very small portion of the painting, but the ambient light and the secondary bounces makes the rest of it more visible in a range of mid-tones. If we reduce the painting to three values, we can see how the dark tones are mostly 75% of the painting. So direct light doesn't always mean a bright scene. It depends on where and how it hits and what you want to show in your painting. Here we have an omni light in this candle lit scene. We can't actually see the light since it's hidden behind her hand, but the effect of it are visible all around. Most of the value is gonna be in mid tones to dark due to the faint light source. The value chart shows the painting is in a low key since most of it in dark and mid contrast mainly around the candle light. If we increase the contrast, we can see clearly the placement of the light and the effect of it on the surrounding areas. And here we see how the light affects the scene. The highest value is in the first direct bounce of the light source, while the rest is all in secondary bounces. Different light source, different value set, and different mood and read to the painting. This is another direct light example, but this time the light is directly on top side of the scene. This kind of light is becoming an artist's favorite, especially with character design lately, due to its focusing the details mostly around the head and chest area. The values here will be from 0 to 10, basically all of them. And even though it will sometimes create a low-key painting, the contrast will be as high as ever, especially in the places between the dark and light. It will result mostly in a high value top and a low value bottom, with interesting values in between. And we can see that in the high contrasted version. Finally, the values are mostly in dark tones, with few mid-tones in between it and the main focal point. In the final example, we see another omni light source, but this time it's visible. Try as hard as you can, but the first thing you look at in this scene is the light source and its surrounding. An omni light source is basically you pointing at the painting and telling the viewer to look right here. It can't get any better of being a focal point. In this painting though, the values are not in high contrast. From the chart we see that there are almost no high value. The whole painting starts from values of 5 or 6 all the way to the dark values. So it's a low key low to mid contrast painting mainly around the light source. But if we increase the contrast, we can see the exact location and effect of the light source. And here are the values. Most in mid-tones with few highlights and overwhelming darkness. Alright, before moving on to the next factor, we usually do a painting demonstration, but we already did the direct light, the rim light, and the ambient light in part 1. So the only one left is the omni light type. So let's do a quick demonstration on it using the same geosphere. Here we have the omni light to the top right of the sphere. The effect of it will be very small on the sphere, but since it has so many faces with different angles, there will be always one face that is directly hit by the omni light, and it goes darker and darker as you go away from it. So I start with the light face, then add the mid tones to its surrounding. The shadow will heavily depend on the position of the omni light. So if the light is from the top right, the shadow will be covering the bottom left of the sphere. Now that I have the main three layers of values done, all is left is enhancing the in-between values. Watch carefully which face of the sphere is pointing to the light and which isn't. A surface can be closer to the light source than others, but facing down and away from the light. The face would be a bit darker than another surface that is a bit further away but pointing more at the light source. The light on the sphere doesn't look at all smoothed out due to the fast decay of the light source. Also, the face is turning away from the light, adding more contrast between the edges. And it's going dark very fast, leaving a mid-tone spotlight on the top right side of the sphere.
Every type of light you use, every different size of it, every position you place it in will result in different values and read to your scene. Now we can move on to the fifth factor, the light bounces. Now what do I mean by bounced light? When light hits an object, it bounces off that object toward your eyes and you see it. That's basically how we see things. But light doesn't just bounce once off an object to another. It keeps bouncing around and around till it no longer has the energy or the photons to do so. Because some surfaces absorb the light and only let go of a part of the light. White surfaces, for example, reflect more light than black surfaces. Same for shiny surfaces versus smart surfaces and so on. So why does bounce light affect the values? It doesn't affect the light value per se, they mostly affect the shadows. If light only bounced once, your scene will be like this. One direct hit toward the sphere and the floor, turning it into high values. And everything else that isn't hit by the direct angle of the light will be automatically black. This doesn't happen in nature, you only get this result with an overexposure like we used to do in the old cameras or over developing the photos in the lab. Here is even a clearer example, with the Asaro head being surrounded in black space with no ground, no walls, no ceilings, just suspended in outer space, this is how it would look like. There will be different values in some of the light zones affected by the different angles of the head, but if a surface has a 90 degree angle in comparison to the light rays, it will be absolutely in black, since there is no reflected light hitting it anywhere. Obviously this type of lighting isn't used in normal situations, but if you require your painting to have this kind of lighting, it's a valid option. But let's see what happens if we add a secondary bounce. We go back to the sphere, here it is with the primary light bounce, and here it is after we add the walls behind it. All of a sudden we have a mid-tone range in between the light and the dark values due to the reflected light from the floor and the walls hitting the other side of the object. Now the walls and the floor start acting like a secondary ambient light source with much lower intensity of course, adding more values to the sphere. This is a more realistic exposure that you usually get in an interior lighting scene. And here is what the Asaro head will look like before and after adding the secondary bounces. Light is again hitting the floors and bouncing back into the dark side of the Asaro head, adding more values to the area. It doesn't affect the intensity of the values in the bright side, but it definitely changes the values in the dark side. Ok, let's go up a level more and add a third bounce to the light. This is where the ambient light of the scene or the sky factors in and adds the values to the scene, acting as a third even fainter light source to the sphere. Also, materials has an effect here. If the materials of the sphere are a bit more glossy, then a light hitting the back wall or coming from the sky will reflect back to the other side of the sphere, adding a lighter mid-tones, narrowing the shadow of the sphere to move away from the edge. This is mostly what we see in the outdoor during the daylight. The sphere will be hit by the direct light, reflected light from the ground, and ambient light from all around. And here it is on the Asaro head, this is with the secondary bounces, and this is with the full range of light bounces. Here we see even lighter reflected light narrowing the shadows into the mid section of the head. Now we won't have master artist examples for the light bounces since we already saw many of it in the first part of the video and the previous factor. Light bouncing isn't a factor by itself but a result you get from mostly all the factors we will talk about here. Any light you use, any material you use, any surrounding area you use will affect the amount of light bounces you will have which will result in different values around your painting. So with that. Let's move on to the next factor, which is surface normal. It's another factor that is a byproduct of the object in your scene. The light bounces are a byproduct of the light source, and surface normal are the same but for the objects in your scene. Surface normal is the base orientation of every surface of your object. Put simply, it's the direction your surface is looking at directly. We saw this example in lesson 1. The more the surface is hit by the light rays, the lighter it will be, and the more it turns away from it, the darker it will get. That's why the surface normal of the object is important. If you light your object randomly without knowing which part of it should be hit mostly by the light, your painting will be confusing, because we won't be able to tell where your light is without seeing its effect on the scene. In this example, we see this uniform geosphere with different surface normal being hit by the direct light. Depending on the angle of the surface, the values will be. An angle of 0 degree between the surface normal and the light ray results in the brightest value. Any angle after 90 degrees will be in the shadow, and everything in between is a level of value between the two. Here we can also add the reflected light or the secondary bounces from the ground. If the light hits the ground at 100%, depending on the material of the floor and its basic values, it may reflect 20-30% to of it back into the sphere. So a surface that was in the shadows with the value of 7 maybe, increased one value up to a 6 due to the reflected light. So now you have a new angle of a secondary light source interacting with the surface normal of the shadow area. 
shadow areas on the other side of the sphere facing the cast shadow will reflect back a darker value of 1 to that surface, resulting in a value of 8. If we deform the geosphere a little bit and change its surface normal values, it will result in completely different values on it. This is a direct example of how surface normal will affect your values. All the calculations we did are now different. So if you are working on an animation and your character moved their arm to the other side, now the values have to be changed as well. And here's another variation as well, changing the scene once more into a different set of values. Again, surface normal are included in the examples we did before, so we won't have special examples for them. They will be pointed out just like the light bounces within the other factors examples. Well, these factors were a bit shorter than the others, weren't they? I should probably have included three more with them, but since I already mentioned it will be four parts, I think I have to stop the video here and conclude this part so that I don't confuse everyone with three parts instead of four. In the next video, we're going to talk about three other factors that affect the value. We're going to talk about the surrounding reflectivity, the basic values and materials, and the minor and major keys values. So again, no homework or outro here. We're going to do all that in the final part. So this is it for the second part of lesson 2 video, I will see you on part 3 next, so see you there.